Welcome to the Dental Billing Academy podcast, powered by ESS Dental Solutions. Hi, dental billers. Thanks for joining another episode of the Dental Billing Academy. I am really, really excited to have uh, Curtis here from Dental Intelligence with me. Hey, Curtis. Hey, Amanda. Thank you so much for having me today. Absolutely. So Curtis is the director of partnerships at Dental Intelligence. Um, And so what he does is he helps take dentists and their practices to the next level um, by providing them the tools to make business decisions using calculated analysis and not emotions. And so very data driven. He's the numbers guy. So what I wanted to do was to have this podcast with him so that we can talk about what dental billers, office managers, front desk administrators need to be looking for in the numbers to really help make sure that we're helping to move the practice forward, knowing what to look for, knowing what goals to set and be able to communicate what the doctor is really looking for and needing um, to show the ultimate value in our Uh, positions within the office, because when we can align our goals with the with the doctor's goals and really be the right hand person and be able to communicate all the necessary information to them, then that really shows the ultimate value. 100%. Yeah. And you, you made that Amanda, you made that sound like it's a lot bigger deal than what I think it is. Uh, uh, Numbers are truly important. But just note that I, uh, I definitely was feel complimented by the way that you introduced me. That was a very nice, nice way of saying it. But ultimately, I, I like to understand the status quo, meaning what's actually happening rather than what we feel like is happening. Right. So and the, I'm excited to go down this road with you today. Well, I'm really excited to have you on. So uh, I don't mind at all hyping you up and making you uh, a, a big deal because I feel like you are. So let's just jump right in. So Curtis, let's start off with what are the numbers that the front desk office managers, dental billers should be looking at to ensure the practice is moving forward. And so in your conversations with doctors, and talking to them about what numbers they should be looking at. This is kind of where I'm taking this question, because like I said, we want to make sure that we're aligning our the numbers that we're looking at and knowing when the practice is profitable with what the doctor is looking at and being able to answer all those questions and make sure those metrics are moving in the right direction. 100%. Well, let's you know how earlier you're saying, hey, I don't want to go off of emotion. I want to go off of the true numbers, right? Well, here's a great example of that. And I'm, I'm sure you've heard this before, but all of the people out there in the podcast world, right? Have you ever had your doctor or you as the doctor even, have you ever said, hey, we produced $100,000 this month. Why didn't we collect $100,000? Right? That right there is the big, one of the biggest and easiest ways to look at it. We think that if we produce X amount, we should collect that same amount. It's not true. That's like saying, well, hey, you know what? I am 5'11", so I should dunk because there's a lot of people that are 5'11 that can dunk a basketball. Well, guess what? I can't, I, I've never been able to dunk a basketball. I've tried my <laughs> whole life to dunk. Uh, And I cannot do it, right? Just because you're one thing does not mean that it's going to result in another, right? So that's, and have you heard that before uh, from a doctor, you yourself saying something like that? Absolutely. I I feel like dental billers everywhere, um, front desk administrators have heard that and had to um, scramble to find that explana- explanation for the doctor because yes. uh, that is difficult to see that you've produced a certain amount and then your collection ratio is not 100%. And w- with doctors not always understanding all of the dental billing procedures like we do, um, there's a lot of questions there. And so the, the question that you asked though, uh, really what number should we be looking at? I was thinking of offering for people who are in collections because there's a lot of different numbers that different team members should be looking at. 
but uh, there's a simple formula. And if you have a pen and paper, write this down. In order to receive more profits in an office, you can either do more visits or more production per visit, a higher collection percentage or lower overhead. So those four areas, there's everything falls into those four areas. People, butts in the chair, if you will, visits, right? How many dollars you're doing on those visits? Those two equals gross production, right? And so many offices will be tracking gross production. But for today, we want to really focus on the third, which is collection percentage. So once again, if I produce if my visits and my production per visit, my production is 100,000. How much should you be collecting? Right? Is it 100,000? I, that's, that's the biggest question. So what is your collection percentage? Meaning if I produce, let's make numbers even smaller. If you produce a thousand dollars on average in your office, what percentage should you be able to collect? So why would that number be lower first? Amanda, any thoughts why that number would be lower than a thousand dollars? If I produce a thousand dollars, why should that number, why would that number ever be lower? Off the top of my head, and just mm -hmm. from my experience, there are lots of variables in that uh, number, right? So you oh, have yeah. out of that a thousand, out of that one thousand uh, dollars portion of it that is the patient's responsibility, maybe all of it, um, and then a portion, possibly um, more cases than not, that is the insurance's uh, responsibility that you are trying to collect from the insurance. Okay, good. So if I produce a crown for $1,000, I get that production done, right? Now, one thing is you might write off $200 because you're PPO. You might write off half of it because it's your neighbor. You might write off another 20% uh, because they're in military, right? So you have adjustments and write-offs. But on top of that, just like you said, you might be collecting from insurance. So there's so many factors that go into this, but you should be able to know in a month span what your collection percentage is of gross. If you produce it, what should you be collecting on average? We're seeing typically right around 80%. Okay. And that number, because if you have insurance as the variable, if you are a practice that uh, accepts and is in network with a lot of insurances, or you have a, um, maybe you're only in network with a couple insurances, but you have an influx of patients with those insurances. You will see that collection ratio differ from month to month because the collections from the insurance companies typically take anywhere from two to four weeks to receive in the office. So on the flip side of that, Curtis, where you're saying, $100,000 production and maybe 80% collection ratio. There have also been times where there's $100,000 in production in a month, but then a collection ratio of 110% because you're actually collecting on the production that you did the month before. Okay, good. So the we, we do want to average that out. So we look at like a 90 day, you want to typically look at a 90 day to average that out. But in general, you should be of your gross production at a consistent amount, whatever that might be. I've seen offices as low as 50% before, and they're fine with that. They know, okay, look, I now need to produce $2,000 to collect 1,000. But now they know where they're at. They know the status quo. Other offices, if they produce 2,000, they're going to collect 2,000 because they are um, fee for service right? It, it just depends on where you are. It's not a bad thing. Here is the thing that you need to realize though, especially when collecting. First off, where are you on the gross production, like we just mentioned, of a collection? Then the second thing is of your net, meaning what can you collect? So if I'm writing off on average 20%, right? And I produce a thousand dollars, 
And on average, I'm supposed to collect 20, uh, I write off 20%, Amanda. How much should I collect? If I produce $1,000 and I'm writing off 20%. Well, you should collect the full $800. 800, I good. Did. Yes. So of net, you should be at 100 plus percent. So there's two things to realize. How much am I writing off? If it, is it 20%? Is it 50%? Is it 5%? And then of what I can collect of that 800 that we just discussed, are we collecting 100%? Those are those two numbers, huge in an, uh, especially as collections that you should be looking at on a at least monthly basis of saying, what of gross am I collecting and what of net am I collecting? So right? looking at them separately. So to get the net, you would take the gross production minus the uh, insurance yeah. adjustments, write-offs to get your net production and then calculate your percentage of collections uh, in your collection rate from, from that net number. So that would be the gross minus your adjustments. So, so it's really important to, to look at both. Um, and then how often Curtis should we be looking at these numbers? Is it a daily, weekly, monthly basis? Good question. So those, those two, I would highly recommend, especially if you're collecting a weekly basis, but reporting to the doctor monthly. So those, he doesn't need to know what's going on week to week, day to day on collections. It's just like, hey, I know what's going on weekly, right? And then of the weekly, uh, you, you uh, report to your doctor on a monthly basis. So if you're a doctor, you should be knowing, looking at this monthly, if you're a team member who's collecting weekly to hit that. Now to make it even easier on a daily basis, I have my own philosophies. There's so many philosophies out there, but I, I think you should be collecting what the, what you think the patient owes before they schedule. If you have that and you're monitoring that as well, you should be hitting your 80% of gross and a hundred percent of net every single week, every single month. But the two numbers to be focusing on is, um, Collections of net, collections of gross, monitored weekly, and doctor or owner should be monitoring it monthly. And it's important to monitor them regularly, whether it's weekly, daily, like you said, um, in some cases, there may be uh, a lot of uh, office managers and front desk administrators that want to look at that daily and really set those goals, which is fine. Um, Regularly, however often it is, it needs to be looked at because there are cases where you can catch um, potential issues in your office um, by looking at these numbers regularly. And you don't want a month or two months to go by and then you are answering tough questions from your uh, practice owner and your doctor about why the collection ratio is low if you are collect, you know, looking at these numbers uh, regularly and, and course correcting to make sure that you are collecting uh, when you can from patients and from the insurance. So, um, you know, you, you could see on a weekly basis um, or a daily basis if you, like Curtis said, didn't collect from the patients um, that day or for that week. And so your collection ratio is much lower because you didn't collect at the time of service or prior to the time of service when they were scheduling, when you were going over the treatment plan. Um, and that can really skew your numbers. And it's much, much harder to get that money owed to the doctor rightfully on those procedures once the patient has left the building. And so then you're looking at never really being able to catch that collection ratio back up um, from those from those days. So it's really important. So it's so, so important. So if we're looking at the collection percentage, like you said, it, it should be looked at often, but if we're really trying to improve on a daily basis, making sure that we're collecting at the patients who are, here's the three areas that I would highly recommend on a daily basis. Number one, the patients who are coming in today, how many of them owe you money? 
Easy. What percentage of the, if I have 10 patients coming in today, out of those 10 patients, how many am I going to be able to talk with? All 10, right? So if those 10 people are coming in and they owe me dollars, I should be able to discuss with them and collect what's already been owed. That's the first one. The second one that you should be highly, I'd highly recommend you looking at is saying of your uh, a billing that is sent to insurance. Whoa, I couldn't get that out. Billing that was sent to insurance. Is there anybody that's over 30 days past due of insurance not paying? So, so as Cigna, is there any claims out that are over 30 days? If you're on that every day, you won't have an issue. Cigna will know, oh no, Jody's re- going to reach out to me again if I don't get this paid because they're all, she's always on top of it. They really do know you, okay? So those, those two and the third one, my, high, my recommendation is making sure that they schedule before they pay, but uh, excuse me, pay before they schedule their portion. But those first two and ultimately third it would be the, the recommendations for a daily uh, look at. Absolutely. And those um, are tough conversations to have with patients sometimes about outstanding balances and then about paying their balance before they schedule. But when you find the right verbiage and you work together as a team, work on it in a team meeting or um, reach out and find um, resources from some of the industry experts uh, like Lois Banta and, and people that have really honed in that communication with patients and find that verbiage that works for you in your office. And, and then you will really start to see that significant difference in your collection ratio every month. And it'll be so much easier. I I remember myself, Amanda, I used to work in dental practice and we uh, implemented that. It was difficult at first, but then it was simple and your patients, they know, Oh yeah. In order to schedule, I need to pay my portion. Great. I, that's totally fine. And then there's less headache in the back end when they come walking into, oh, hey, you're, you have your appointment day. You need to, we need to, to collect. There was mo- one instance where we did not follow that rule. A patient came in and we did 20 crowns on them, 10 on top, 10 on bottom. And we thought, you know, oh, this guy is, he's excited. He's going to pay, blah, 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 blah. We got everything done. And guess what? He never paid and he never came back to put his crowns on, but he got all, we spent all those dollars. We even sent it to the lab, right? Basically we did everything except for uh, cementing the crowns in and we never got paid on top of that. The doctor spent the full day or half a day, whatever, you know, whatever you want to look at it on uh, not uh, producing and not working on anyone else. So it's very important that you uh, look at collections, how to fix the issue in the future, how to fix it today. Absolutely. And it has the added benefit of reducing cancellations, which is every front desk administrator's thorn in their side, right? So it's right there. It it hurts hurts. so bad. And so you reduce that uh, unnecessary, unwanted uh, expense of empty operatory chairs, board providers, um, you know, by, by the, the patients more inclined to come in for their appointment when they've already paid for it. They know that the treatment needs to be done um, because they've already paid uh, for the treatment. And so they tend to come to those appointments uh, more often when that happens. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we see that time and time again. And ultimately, once again, if we're looking at how can I'm having an issue with net collections or gross collections? Well, what's the root cause? If you fix that, then you you're not trying to get, you know, like hurting cats, right? If you know, oh, I know if I do something that cat's going to escape. So instead of trying to hurt them, you have them under control. And that's our patients. I mean, I don't know how you guys feel, but oftentimes my patients, it felt, it felt like I was hurting cats uh, with them. And so that, and that's where numbers come into play. 
you now know, okay, this is what's going on. How can I, what actions can I do to make it so that this doesn't happen again? Perfect. Well, let's take just a quick uh, sponsor break, Curtis. We'll come right back and we will start talking uh, some more about numbers and uh, reviewing them and, and setting goals and fun things like that. Awesome. Thanks, Amanda. This podcast is sponsored by eAssist Dental Solutions. eAssist helps dentists collect 100% of what dentists are owed by insurance companies. Their dental billing experts work with dentists and their teams to ensure the claim submission process is smooth and that dentists and their staff can focus on patient care. If you or someone you know is in need of assistance with the dental billing process, call 1-844-E-ASSIST or visit dentalbilling.com to find out more. All right, so we're going to pick this conversation back up with Curtis Marshall from Dental Intelligence. Um, so let's jump in. We've talked about what numbers to look for, how often to review them. Let's talk about a P&L report a little bit, Curtis, and, and um, what numbers the, the dental billers and the office administrators can look at, can contribute. If this is not something that you do in your practice, because you may be in a, um, you know, single dentist, small practice, um, P&L reports are uh, very popular among larger dental offices and, and groups to really monitor the overhead. But, uh, you know, single practices with, with one dentist, they need to do the same thing every dentist everywhere needs to monitor their overhead and, and make sure that they are profitable every month um, and review those numbers. So if this is not something that you have implemented in your office, I think you could really wow your doctor by creating one and, and reviewing it monthly with them. So what I want to do is kind of get the knowledge from you, Curtis, on what that could look like for some of these offices that are not um, part of large dental practices, maybe has, have never even looked at a P&L report before. Um, why is it important? What should they be going over with the doctor? Um, different things like that, like just help educate and, and set it up for us. Yeah, just for everyone out there, P&L, it means profit and loss, right? So Amanda, this is a great question. Now, remember in the first portion of the segment, we talked about there's four areas for the profitability formula that Dental Intel's created. The first two relates around production. It's how many butts are in the chair or visits, whatever you want to call it. And then how many dollars are you doing on each visit? Okay. Then we really discussed in, our, in the first segment on the collection percentage, making sure that we collect as much as possible of that production. We're not always going to collect 100% of the total production. So we want to know the collection percentage. The last one is overhead. Now overhead, the big portion is the profit and loss statement. Now, if you, as far as for any office that's interested, I've got a, a, a profit and loss sheet I'd be happy to give you for free uh, so that you guys can know exactly what categories, but I'd like to give an example here. Um, in an office, you guys, you have burrs, right? You have certain burrs and then you've got, um, well, actually a whole bunch of different types of burrs, right? If you had buckets or little containers of burrs and you've got your endo burr, you've got your polishing burr. I don't know the names of burrs. <laughs> uh, I'm making it up now. Your shiny burr, your diamond burr. Okay. If you have all of them in one container, Amanda, you're going to be very frustrated, right? You're going to be like, oh, I know there's one in here somewhere digging all through the burrs and finding hope. Oh, oh, is that one it? Maybe. Nope. Actually, it's the doctor said it's not. I need another one, right? Mm -hmm. Instead, what you do is you organize your burrs so that you know exactly I have only one of these birds left. I need to call my representative and get more. Or uh, I hope you're understanding where I'm getting at here, Amanda. Absolutely. Right? Yes. Okay. A profit and loss sheet or PL is very similar. 
oftentimes, here's what we're seeing. We're seeing dentists that they, uh, de uh, dental offices, not dentists necessarily, but dental offices that say, oh, I have this expense of buying equipment. And so I'm going to put it into this category that I think it goes into. Well, it's like throwing all your burrs into one, one bucket. It doesn't help you to know where to improve. So you need to have what's called a chart of accounts that's giving you, oh, this goes in this bucket, this one goes in this bucket and so forth on down. If you know exactly what, how much you have in each of these little buckets, then you know exactly where to improve, just like your burrs. Oh, instead of saying I got a full bucket of burrs, you're now of my diamond ones, I need some more or I have way too many, right? And so this profit and loss statement, uh, I'd be happy to send anyone uh, who reaches, and I, I'll give it to you, Amanda, and you can give it to anyone. Uh, what's called a chart of accounts. That's for your profit and loss uh, statement. Be happy to do that. But ultimately, you want to put them into the right categories. Because if you don't put them into the right categories, it's useless. It's like having a big old bucket of burrs instead of knowing exactly how many are of each bird you have left. So that's the biggest thing that I would say in, uh, if you're a team member. If you bring that to the doctor and say, hey, look, I want to know exactly where to improve our profit and loss, not just check the box, right? But I want to know exactly where to improve. You will you'll be a high, of high value and well noted within the practice by doing something like that. Absolutely. And organizing them, like you said, uh, allows you to um, hone in on certain areas and problem solve um, solutions with your doctor for lowering those overhead expenses. And so if you are seeing your collection ratio go up month over month because the production and your production per hour is going up, you have patients just calling and scheduling all the time and coming through the door and life is wonderful, but your doctor expresses to you that the practice is still not as profitable as it should be. And no one really knows why. This is where a PL report, it comes in super handy. You can do a deep dive into the specific areas of your overhead. Uh, so your lab costs may have gone up and it's time to look at another lab or renegotiate those lab costs. Um, you could be uh, incurring more credit card processing fees because you're running more credit card payments because you're seeing more patients. Those are things that you can really hone in on and, and look at, determine if that is something to renegotiate or look into other options, or if it's just a, an expense that goes up due to productivity and patient volume going up. And it's just something that you have to expect, but there are areas of the PL that the doctor um, could absolutely use input and uh, solution oriented team members helping to find, uh, you know, wiggle room uh, to lower that and increase practice profitability. Yeah. And the biggest point behind all this, Amanda, you're spot on. I love the way that you put that together because it is, it is so true for dental offices. And the, but the issue is, is that the profit and loss statement is usually created by their tax guy, right? Their accountant. And they are just having a typical business chart of accounts, not a dental one. That'd be like saying, oh, hey, I want a cleaning. And everyone should know exactly what type of cleaning that is. We know in dental, dental you don't just get a cleaning, right? You either get a profi, an SRP, or a perio maintenance. And there's probably some more on top of those, but it's not a cleaning. It is very specific. Same thing with the profit and loss. You need to have one, a chart, a chart of accounts for your profit and loss of, for dental, for, for a dental practice and not just a, a generic one. And so once again, if you feel like you'd like, uh, feel like you'd like to have one, uh, reach out to Amanda and uh, she'll give you the one that I'll provide to her. Yeah, just email me at podcast at esis.me and I will shoot that over. Thank you, Curtis, for providing that. That's fantastic. Um, so it's in continuing to speak about the P&Ls, a big part of that, you know, it 
you want to look at the numbers and you want to review and um, make sure that you're profitable and you are keeping your overhead um, in control. But another big part of that is going to be setting goals for your practice. And so what are in, in your expertise, um, some very practical, realistic goals to set, uh, for a practice to set for the, for the front office and the office manager to, to tell the doctor, this is what I'm shooting for, um, every month to increase that practice profitability and make sure they're always on the path to success. Oh my goodness. This is, this is a huge debate everywhere, right? Uh, one thing you often say is, well, what is, what is every other dentist doing, right? That's one thing that a lot of offices will say, well, what, where am I at compared to all these? Well, it's good to know the industry and what, what's typical, but ultimately, Amanda, I dare say that your goal needs to first start off with where are you at today? And then just say, I want to do 5%, 10%, 20% better. Where are you at first? You need to understand that. Very similar to somebody losing weight, right? Hey, if you want to lose weight, how much are you going to lose? Well, typically people lose 20 pounds when they start to work out. They do a a program. Well, uh, me personally, I can't lose. If I jump on a program like that, I'm not going to lose 20 pounds, right? And so depending on who you are, you need to know where you're at first and then say, this is my goal moving forward. So that's whenever you're looking at goals, don't make a goal until you know where you are first. Right. That's a great point. So if you are already, like we talked about in the first half of this podcast, if you're already a fee for service office, or you're already collecting a hundred percent of a collection ratio every month, you know, you you can set a goal to continue that uh, or to never let it get below 90%. Um, So you can set goals in kind of the adverse um, benchmarks, right? Don't let it get below this point or don't let our overhead um, be over 35%, um, things like that. But if you are in a spot where after you've calculated your gross um, production and that collection ratio, and then your net um, production collection ratio, and you're at 80% or less, um, there are goals as dental billers and front desk administrators uh, to set to increase that. And lots of ways that you can look to increase that. If you're only receiving paper checks, um, check out EFTs, you get paid faster. Oh, good um, yeah. If um, you have a, a many pages of an insurance aging report that you're not able to check, uh, really making sure that you look at those regularly, daily, weekly, like Curtis said, just bug the fire out of those insurance representatives until they pay. Um, Just several things that you can do that you can control in the practice to reach those goals and then communicate that with your doctor. Yep. So, so just like Amanda was saying here uh, that you need to understand not only where you're at first, but also have those goals. So here's the three goals uh, yeah. to give you, right? Hit us with them. Yeah. So write these down. These these are the areas, especially once again, we're not talking about production today on numbers. We're talking about after production, two big areas, the collection percentage and the overhead. Okay. So the first one really should be your goal in any office. I don't care what office you're in. You really should or be fairly close to zero dollars past 30 days. But what, what, why, why should we have any, whether it's insurance or patient, we shouldn't have anything what's considered past due after 30 days, okay? So that would be the first one, a goal. Now you might be far from it, you might be close to it, you might already be hitting it. But my recommendation is to say, your ultimate goal is to be zero dollars 
for 30, uh, 30 plus days with AR, uh, total AR and insurance bill AR. Okay. Number one. And if you're not there yet, it's okay. By the way, if you're not there, just find out where you are and do a little bit better. Knock that number down until you get close to zero. Okay. Any thoughts there, Amanda? Any no, issues? that is, that is great. That is absolutely number one goal. And just a side note, if you are there, just go ahead and give yourself a little pat on the back. Yep. You need it. Give yourself another pat. Yeah. Uh, because <laughs> uh, like Curtis said, if you're not, that's okay. That is the, that is common in, in a lot of dental um, practices. doesn't matter what your specialty is. Um, you just need to develop some strategies and some protocols. Um, there are additional resources out there to help um, get that over 30 day total AR and insurance AR down to zero. So what's the next one, Curtis? Next one, we're going to add on the collection percentage. We're going to say net, your net collection percentage. So what you can collect after write-offs and after adjustments, you should be at very close to just below or just above 100%. Your goal should be, if uh, to be more accurate nationwide, 98%. 98% of your net collections should be uh, what you can collect. You should be at 98%. Absolutely. The insurance plus patient um, uh, copay on services should eat. You should be getting 100%, uh, 98 at least, uh, percent of what the doctor is rightfully owed on those services. Um, so not taking into consideration PPO adjustments and, and write-offs. Yeah. And, and so those are the two big ones. Here's the last one. And it's uh, once you have your know your overhead, right? Your overhead sh can and should be below 50%. Uh, I would even say be that this is nationwide 50%. No, no reason to be over that. Uh, and so if you're below that, great. Go even lower, by the way. Uh, go as low as 45%. But 50% of your overhead, that's the, should be the goal, uh, is 50% of your overhead. So those three areas, number one, once again, $0 past 30 days, there should be no, nothing in past due dollars, ultimately, unless there's some weird exception, but there should be $0. 100% of collection percentage, of uh, uh, net collection percentage is number two, and 50% of overhead. And that 50% overhead needs to be calculated on your net production as well, correct? So of collection percentage um or the net net collection percentage, you're right. So then it, so not factoring in the adjustments and write-offs when you are calculating your overhead percentage. Yes, correct. Okay. I don't think we clarified that before. And so I just wanted to make sure that that was uh, accurate for everyone that's taking notes on this. This is amazing stuff. Um, I am guaranteed to have Curtis back for more podcast episodes. So if you have other areas that you want him to discuss, please email me at podcast at ess.me and uh, tell me what you want me to ask Curtis. Uh, we might just have a regular Ask Curtis Questions uh, podcast and uh, just go through all of the questions that every dental biller has about looking at numbers, um, setting goals and things like that, because he, this has just been extremely insightful and I've learned so much. Well, we got anything yet. We could even talk to a whole thing just on uh, collection percentage or the dental billing uh, percentages. Uh, there's there's a lot that we didn't quite dig into today. Yeah, Amanda, thanks for having me. I, Absolutely. I, I, um, I, I agree with you. I think we'll take your three big goals and we will just deep dive into those in each a different episode of this Dental Billing Academy podcast. So we'll get those on the books, Curtis, because talking to you is so much fun. And um, that way you can just give dental billers everywhere all the knowledge that's in your brain. I think they need it. So thank you so much for joining me. Um, and I'm excited to have you back. Thanks, man. And thanks, everybody. Hope you have a great day. 
click subscribe now to never miss an episode and find us on Facebook to expand your network.